Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be delving into more true and terrifying tales. Before we get started, though, if you have a true scary story that you would like to share, go to ravenreadshorror.com forward slash pages forward slash story, and you can submit your story there. You can also check out the shop while you're there. The other shop I have is SpookyLovely.com, which is the apparel and Teespring shop. I'm updating the designs there pretty much all the time, so keep checking it out to see if there's something you might like. As always, links to Patreon and anything you might need, including the other channels and podcasts, are always in the description below. But without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable. Grab a beverage of choice and get ready to take another journey into the night. Our Yellowstone journey began in California with seven adults. We caught a flight to Salt Lake City, Utah, and from there drove to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had arranged to stay in a cabin. We arrived at the cabin, which was sizable, around 5 o'clock p.m. on the first day. The ground floor housed a living room, a kitchen, a master bedroom, and a dining room, with a set of stairs on either side leading to the upper level. Additionally, there were entrances from outside into the kitchen and outside the master bedroom, apart from the main entrance that opened into the living room. The upper level comprised about four bedrooms and three bathrooms. The cabin had an old, rustic feel to it. Our first evening at the cabin was uneventful. However, as night fell, an eerie feeling took hold. My husband and I retired to one of the upstairs bedrooms, while two other couples occupied the master bedrooms downstairs and upstairs. The only single member of our group took the bedroom next to ours. Given our plan to set off early for Yellowstone the next day, we all turned in for the night around 11 o'clock p.m. No sooner had my husband and I hit the sack that we fell into a deep sleep. However, I was jolted awake by a scream, which turned out to be my own. Simultaneously, my husband also woke up screaming. Although I have had instances of crying in my sleep due to nightmares, this was the first time I had screamed, and I distinctly remember not having any dreams or nightmares that night. As for my husband, it was highly unusual for him to have a nightmare, let alone wake up screaming. Our friend in the adjacent room, who was on a call, heard our screams and rushed to check on us. We assured him that we were okay, if not confused, and tried to get back to sleep. But I spent the rest of the night battling strange feelings, unable to sleep until the first rays of sunlight peeked through the window. The next morning, we were all up at around nine o'clock in the morning, discussing the previous night's incident. The other two couples, unaware of our midnight ordeal, reported hearing random footsteps throughout the night. Thankfully, no other strange incidents occurred during our five-day stay. Yet, the cabin radiated a considerable amount of negative energy, and none of us were keen on spending more time there than necessary. We would leave early in the morning and return late at night, using the cabin merely as a space to sleep. Thankfully, we haven't experienced anything similar since then. My tale unfolds on the big island of Hawaii when I was around 10 or 11 years old. My father was an avid hunter of wild boars and sheep, and occasionally, he would take our family to a remote cabin that my uncles had constructed. The exact location of the cabin is hard to pinpoint, but it was an hour's off-road drive up the mountain, 
from an obscure road that branched off the main highway. This quaint one-story cabin's front door was a sliding glass door. Across from it, you could see three rooms, each furnished with two bunk beds, but no doors for privacy. The cabin's bathroom was a primitive outhouse, lacking light and running water, nestled within a clutch of trees and bushes. Despite the cabin's lack of amenities and poor ventilation, which made it quite chilly, the place had a certain charm. However, I couldn't shake off the sensation of spiritual presence, perhaps due to my uncle's story of an enormous battle that had taken place in the vicinity during ancient times. This immediately made me think of night marchers, which, although just a part of Hawaiian folklore, for some people, are perceived as extremely real entities by native Hawaiians. During this trip, my cousin, sister, and I found ourselves exploring the expanse around the cabin, an open field laden with grass, weeds, and bordering trees growing over lava rocks. Out of boredom, we picked up some hammers and started breaking into small lava tubes, hoping to discover something interesting. These tubes weren't massive like caves, but small pockets that had formed due to air bubbles trapped in the flowing and later hardened lava. You could identify them by merely tapping your shoe on the surface and listening to the sound. Much to our surprise, one such lava tube did contain something. A pile of bones, cushioned by long brown bird feathers. These bones, which didn't appear to belong to a human, but rather some animal, perhaps a chicken, were strikingly well preserved and still bore hints of pinkish red color, suggesting freshness. We were puzzled. How did these bones get inside the tube? Why weren't they destroyed by the lava? The only plausible explanation we could think of was that these bones were an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, given that the volcano hadn't been active for centuries. Out of respect, we quickly sealed the tube's opening with rocks and retreated, choosing not to mention this to our parents. The following morning, our father asked us if any of us had visited the outhouse early in the day. When we all denied it, he shared that he had seen a large figure standing at the sliding door, presumably having returned from the outhouse. Unable to discern the figure in the darkness, he dismissed it as a dream. However, the possibility that it might have been the entity whose offering we had disturbed terrified me. The figure could have been a human, but considering the cabin's remote location, it seemed very unlikely. Regardless, after that unnerving encounter, I never stayed at that cabin again. Although I've always held an interest in the paranormal, I've remained largely skeptical, favoring evidence-based explanations. I enjoy watching ghost hunting videos on YouTube and browsing through paranormal-themed subreddits. I have visited many supposedly haunted locations in the United States, such as the Omni Parker House in Boston, the Molly Brown House in Denver, the Whaley House in San Diego, Alcatraz at night, and the Winchester House on multiple occasions. Despite all this, I have never encountered any tangible evidence leaving me to oscillate between curiosity and skepticism. That was until a few months ago. I had arranged a surprise party and weekend getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She wanted to go skiing, and so I organized the trip well in advance, inviting some of her closest friends. We ended up staying in a large Airbnb cabin in Tahoe, California, nestled amidst numerous similar cabins. It had enough rooms to accommodate all of us, a basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. As it was her birthday, my girlfriend and I took the master bedroom upstairs. On the first night, we celebrated with drinks and games. Balloons that we'd set up in the living room kept popping at strange intervals. 
Someone suggested it was the heater vents causing the pops, but I was doubtful. Yet, I didn't want to stir up any unease, so I simply observed. Later that night, we could still hear balloons popping downstairs intermittently between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. On the second night, after a day out in the snow, the strange occurrences intensified. As we were all quite tired, we decided to call it a night earlier than before. It was then that I had my first eerie experience. It was so cold, so I went downstairs to adjust the thermostat. As I walked down the dark stairwell, I heard the floor creaking behind me, like someone was following me. The noises continued until I reached the thermostat, then stopped abruptly. I felt watched and called out to who I thought was my friend. Turning around, I found no one there. I was a bit unnerved, but kept it to myself and returned upstairs. About half an hour later, I decided to crank up the thermostat again. As I went downstairs, the only creaks I heard this time were from my own steps. However, as I was adjusting the thermostat, I heard the ball from the foosball table nearby roll across its surface and hit the side wall. Startled and unable to explain the phenomenon, I hurriedly returned to bed. On our drive back home the following morning, the topic of the popping balloons came up. Seeing an opportunity, I shared my experiences. As I finished, my girlfriend's friend, who had been staying across the hall from us, turned pale. She revealed that the previous night, she'd seen a shadowy figure at the foot of her bed. Upon waking her boyfriend, the figure had vanished. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the next room, then admitted that she'd heard what sounded like breathing in her room. Alone, these incidents could perhaps be rationally explained, but when considered together, it was hard to deny that something unusual had been happening. This experience has turned me from a skeptic into a cautious believer. As for future encounters with the paranormal, I'd prefer if this was my first and last. I once booked an Airbnb cabin nestled in the mountains of the Gold Coast with a group of friends. This cabin, with a history stretching back 100 to 200 years, was the backdrop for a series of eerie, inexplicable incidents that happened over our weekend stay. From the moment we set foot inside, an uncomfortable vibe permeated the air. The ambience seemed to tinge our moods leaving us feeling unusually drained and edgy. The house was peppered with odd objects that only amplified the unsettling feel. Scissors pinned to walls, antiquated nails and farming tools repurposed as decor, unnerving masks, a heart pierced with nails mounted on the wall, rosary beads and more. The odd occurrences commenced on our first night as two of us lay downstairs, sleep eluding us due to an intense feeling of being watched, we were startled by a resounding crash. The door leading to a small foyer, which in turn led to the living area and rest of the house, had been hit with such a force that it trembled on its hinges. On the following night, as we relaxed on the deck overlooking the forest, we tried to mimic the loud bang to our friends, who had slept through the incident. After we had thumped the wall three times in demonstration, we heard three heavy thuds echoing from the balcony's corner, followed by the eerie sound of a spare chair being dragged. Feeling increasingly unsafe, we opted to consolidate our sleeping arrangements, moving a mattress into a single room so we could stick together. When three of us were in the room, a window slammed shut with a loud bang. In the early hours of the night, as everyone slept soundly, I found myself awake at 3 a.m. I noticed a shadow moving across the same window that had earlier shut so abruptly, 
and I started recording it. In the video, a white figure entered and exited the frame, which I didn't notice until the next day. It was a clearly visible face. The final and most terrifying event happened just as dawn broke. I woke up to find a man standing at the foot of the bed. He was adorned in traditional indigenous attire, wearing a skirt and sash in red, black, and white, and brandishing a spear. His face was drawn into a severe scowl. In my initial panic, I assumed it was one of the Airbnb owners, and I shook my friend awake. She saw no one, and when I turned to look again, the figure had vanished. Overwhelmed, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I asked my friend to leave the place early with me. Strangely, as soon as we were about a kilometer away from the cabin, I felt my normal self again. When I was approximately 12, our residence was a remote cabin located down an extended gravel road in the countryside. Our home was a mile from the nearest neighbor, providing us with total isolation. My stepfather and I, united by a shared interest in the paranormal, often embarked on explorations together. Our shared fascination with the supernatural formed a strong bond between us. In our house, bedrooms were fitted with rotating dial lights, which could be adjusted from off to dim and then to bright. Strangely, every night, the dial would seem to twist of its own volition. Moreover, the stereo in my room would occasionally turn on by itself, with the volume fluctuating unpredictably. My parents would often hear what they presumed to be my voice in the dead of night, they reported instances of a figure resembling me roaming the hallways, standing in their bedroom, and even sitting at the edge of their bed. However, each time my stepfather would sit up and call out my name, the apparition would vanish. On investigating, they would always find me sound asleep in my bed. Once, my mother even experienced being dragged to the foot of the bed during the night. My stepfather mentioned that whenever he passed by my room, he could hear hushed voices emanating from it, even when I was alone and fast asleep. One peculiar incident involved my stepfather getting ready for work, brushing his teeth in the bathroom. Out of the corner of his eye, he spotted what he described as an elderly Native American shaman. He claimed they even shared eye contact, yet the figure continued walking and gradually faded into nothingness. <laughs> 